And I compared why Somalis in Kenya are doing better than Somalis in Ethiopia. It's not because Ethiopians are bad. Actually, at the personal level, you will be surprised. The relationship, and I was born in Ethiopia, the relationship between Somalis and Ethiopians. That's not a problem. The problem is the nature of the state. Ethiopia is a good state or bad state. But just from historical point of view, we're still in motion. Ethiopia is still forming its state. It's not a completed state, despite what you, uh, you know, Jesuits wrote. And you will go back to history. If you really look at the people who wrote Ethiopian history, most of them had church background, Jesuits. Just quickly, you guys heard that Abi now uh, sort of weaponizing his 120 million. I think he has not started that with the MOU. He has started that as soon as he came to power in 2018. And basically, he was in response to a young Greg who said, we want our own state. I also like to join the choir to uh, congratulate and thank, to congratulate and thank the, uh, the East African Institute and its collaboration with the Nairobi University on this occasion. Uh, I'd like to uh, discuss with you a paper that I'm working on uh, in complete Ethiopian state formation, the source for conflicts in the Horn of Africa. I think several issues have been mentioned by previous speakers from the environmental issue to of, uh, Minister of Hirsi to Abdul Saeed's uh, uh, diplomacy and uh, 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 you know working with the public and to Kainan's last piece on the nature of Ethiopia. So I will try to read the uh, the uh, the abstract of the paper and then probably just quickly run through the slides to the extent possible. But I'd like to say that I think it was Ali Mazrui, and I'm very happy to be quoting or paraphrasing the giant, the late Ali Mazrui, standing in Nairobi today when he said that, and I like to be to, to apologize, you cannot rule Uganda with or without uh, propaganda. I think that's what he said. I think you cannot really have peace and sustainability with or without the Ethiopian state. You have to work with it, but you have to also make sure that somebody really <laughs> curtails the, the, my, the, the Ethiopian state. Some of the cell phone is just uh, turning off. So let me quickly move. The crisis in the Horn of Africa has deepened in the last few years resulting in conflicts, famine, and civil war-like conditions that have been mentioned this morning. How should one understand this unending crisis in the Horn of Africa, particularly Somalia, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and partly Kenya? In 1964, Ethiopia and Somalia fought their first war, and I'm not talking the old wars, in modern wars only when Somalia was only three years old. In 1974, uh, the biggest famine took place in Ethiopia, northern Ethiopia, and then 1984. In 1977, the Western Somali Liberation Front, which birthed the Ogaden National Liberation Front, in collaboration with the Somali state, had the famous 1977-78 Ogaden War, which really was a precursor for what we see today in the world. Unadulterated interventions of big powers. And if some of you remember, the Warsaw involvement in the Ogaden War was never seen before. The entire Warsaw Pact members came to the Ogaden and ejected Somalis and the Western, uh, Western Somali British Front. That's when Ethiopia's debt crisis started. $10 billion that Ethiopia inherited, and those problems are today haunting Ethiopia. The question is, how should one explain the Horn of Africa's perennial state failure? Why are states in the Horn of Africa not functional, particularly on focusing Ethiopia and Somalia to an extent? In this paper, I will argue that this phenomenon can only be understood 
within the concept of incomplete or and failed nation states uh, in the region. And as a result of that, we are having everything that has been described, whether it's the famine, the autocratic rulers that we have in the region, and the crisis. So partly responding to this condition is plus a long-standing dream to liberate the Western Somali Liberation Front. You have two contested ideas in the Horn of Africa. And one is what the one that Somalis and others uh, hold dearly, and the other one is the one that Ethiopia wants to keep, which is an empire state. And I think it's very interesting for both the scientists and historians to understand that we don't have a uniform African state here. We have two form, forms of African states. One is an imperial state, and that's the Ethiopian state, just the same as England. Despite the fact that some African intellectuals have this starting all the way from, you know, Dubois and, and precursors, we have this notion of idealizing Ethiopia as the, the image that has never been colonized. But I think that also comes with its own issues that most Africans don't like to see, and that Ethiopia is nothing but an imperial state, as much as England was an imperial state, as much as France and Italy and every European power was. And they committed, Ethiopia committed the same problems that others did. Ethiopia had slavery, the Shangilas have been sold back and forth until recently. It had also people that have been colonized, not only Somalis, but the Oromos, the Sh <laughs> so Ethiopia is a miniature of imperial state that exists within a largely neo-colonial, uh, uh, post-colonial region. And I compared why Somalis in Kenya are doing better than Somalis in Ethiopia. It's not because Ethiopians are bad. Actually, at the personal level, you will be surprised. The relationship, and I was born in Ethiopia, the relationship between Somalis and Ethiopians. That's not a problem. The problem is the nature of the state. For instance, people are impressed with the success Somalis have in, in Kenya, both at the state the participation as well as the business. Even some people are crying that Somalis have dominated business in Nairobi. Very good. I think that's American Western you know, capitalism which Somalis love. In Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, despite 200 years of colonialism, there is no single hotel in Addis Ababa that the Somali owns. Those are the issues we like to really explain. Why? Why Somalis thrive in Zambia, in Minnesota, in everywhere, and not in Ethiopia? Because it has not been decolonized. Until and unless you decolonize, you will not have really. Uh, so I should just go to uh, the slides. I'll just. Uh, am I right? Okay. So. Uh, part of the article is to really see, as I said, going back historically to the nature of a state and demystify some of the things that Westerners abundantly and kindly wrote about Ethiopia. The Purpulus of Eritrea is the first European account about Ethiopia. Guess what? There are only several areas that book mentions. It mentions Aksum, which was not part of Ethiopia. At, the, at that time, actually, there was nothing called Ethiopia. It was Abyssinia that came even late. They're just talking about the people that were there. They mentioned Aksum, which was far from Gondar, which is the Amara state, as we speak today. And the book says that often, every now and then, uh, the traders come and bring some goods to Aksum to be shipped through the the, the port, but they mentioned Somali civilization is abundantly from Ras Hafun to Berbera to other other uh, Somali coastal areas. So Somalis were at that time as much you know active as Aksum was. Uh, so the, you know the Ethiopia that we talk, which Ethiopia really capitalized in this book, the purpose of Eritrea, and most people don't read. It's not really talking much about Ethiopia. It's talking about coastal people and mostly about Somali coastal areas. Uh, and then the 
I was at a conference the, at the, in the University of Miami, and one of the key speakers was talking about the big events in Africa. So he talks about Tedros, he talks about Minilik, he talks about everything. And I was a bit taken aback by, you know, completely remaining oblivious to Ahmed Al Ghazi, Ahmed Guri, Somalis, who invaded from Adel all the way down to Musawa and, you know, uh, Gondar and what have you. The day he was capturing the outskirts of uh, Addis Ababa, he collected 10,000 armed troops in, on the gates of Addis Ababa. 10,000. Today, Somalia doesn't have 10,000. I'm not even talking about the Juran civilizations, which can match, and that's another history. But the fact is that the Somali who invaded, and, and, and that article that the speaker was talking about, the changing, the events that changed Africa. You know, Isman Danfodio, Sakature, Shaka the Great, and why he didn't mention Ahmed Al Ghazi, who reconfigurated the only empire in Africa. It's only one thing. It's a Eurocentric, Euro Christian view of Africa, particularly of the Horn of Africa, period. That's why you don't, you have depth of literature about Somali and Somali history. And then Minilik Kamis. Very interesting, when you read the history of Minilik and, 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 and uh, uh, Johannes and, you know, it's the same time that Ahmed uh, uh, Wilwa is literally stopping the Oromo expansion, which he succeeded on the outskirts of Jigjiga and Harar, whereas all the Amara princes could not stop the Oromo invasion. To tell you that Somalis was a bit stronger at that time, and, you know, kept the Oromo invasion. And then, all the way up to 1920, the Ethiopian form, uh, who formed Ethiopia, the Johannes, the Menelik, were fighting as local chieftains, whereas the Sayyid Muhammad Abdullah Hassan was really taken into task several European powers, several European powers, to a point where the Queen of England woke up one morning and said, who is this savage who is embarrassing me that I'm reading every morning when I wake up? And Somali history has not been emphasized to the extent that it deserves. And that is giving Ethiopia the chance, which those of us who are very keen on Ethiopian history kind of question. Uh, I'll just jump uh, over Menelik as most of you guys know. Uh, but really, uh, he is the first one, the first one that at least united parts of Ethiopia. Mainly, mainly the parts of the Tigray, uh, Amara, and Oromia. Uh, at the time, the Sayyid Muhammad Abdullah Hassan unfortunately gets defeated, but they are contemporaries. So that's the parallel history. You have two histories running along each other. Now, to me, this picture, this slide is very interesting. On, the, on one side is the British uh, agreement to, to set the Houd and Reserve area as late as after the Second World War, all the way to 1954. The one on the right is the co-optation, the seminar or the conferences when Haile Selassie was co-opting the Eritrean Federation. They're happening at the same time. It's a progress in which the Ethiopian state formation is still ongoing, but not complete. 50, 1954. So that conference I went to Miami, which was the 50th year anniversary of the Derg, tells you that if Somali, the Ogaden, last part of the Ogaden region was ceded to Ethiopia in 1954, by the time Mengistu Haile Mariam took power, Somalis were only 20 years inside the Ethiopian state. Only 20 years. I mean, when you look at the longevity of the history, 20 years is nothing. Why Somalis don't speak Amharic? Why Somalis don't be part of the Ethiopian state? Because they've only been here for a few years. I mean, can you imagine? My dad was uh, married to my mom when the British consulate was giving Somalis marriage certificate. It's just as recent as yesterday. It's not to really say that Ethiopia is a good state or bad state, but just from historical point of view, we're still in motion. Ethiopia is still forming its state. It's not a completed state, despite what you, you know, Jessa wrote. 
and you will go back to history. If you really look at the people who wrote Ethiopian history, most of them had church background, Jesuits, or people who were sent from big powers to help the... the. Now, these are only a number of the identity-based uh, movements in Ethiopia that have existed from the Ogari National Liberation Front, Western Somali Liberation, TPLF, OLF, OLA, Sidama, Afar, go on and on and on. And, on. and, and state formation is an antithesis to these groups. Just quickly, you guys heard that Abiy now uh, sort of weaponizing his 120 million. I think he has not started that with the MOU. He has started that as soon as he came to power in 2018. And basically, he was in response to a young Greg who said, we want our own state. He responded by saying, why do you need your state when you go to Mogadishu and make money and send that money? This is 2018. So this, right as soon as he came, he just moved to this, uh, uh, again, just uh, Ethiopia is claiming that it would be 20, uh, by 2040. 195 million, whereas uh, Somalia is uh, very small in com compared to that. Uh, so I think it is the, the issue of the Ethiopian Somali is not only political, it's not only history, it's also a typical center periphery conflict. Center periphery conflict in the sense that Ethiopia's expedition never had really in the past, unlike what scholars, some scholars may, may claim, to establish a state, but to rob and, and just exploit to the extent possible the non-Abyssinian people. If anybody writes 17 tribes of Somaliland by, by uh, 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 Colonel, uh, I think I'm missing his name, he's talking about how Ethiopia's expedition was just, you know, looting looting from you know villages and everywhere and that looting is happening today even in the Tigray war the level of looting that the Ethiopian government was committing is unparalleled in the history uh, then I think the until recently Ethiopia has been featured by strong men who really symbolizes the state. The state doesn't c work through its, cr uh, cr uh, its infrastructures. It's mainly as a result of the, a very strong man who has, you know, the power, whether Mengistu was a dictator, Abi is an autocratic ruler, or Hele Selassie was the untouched king. It's the tyrant, it's the autocrat, it is the untouched king who is, uh, who is a symbol of the state and not uh, uh, other way. So I think in the paper, I'm just concluding by saying uh, we need to really take a very bold action in rethinking how we can really stabilize this, the region. You're not going to, to stabilize this region with the old version of states that you have. You cannot have an empire in an era when identity politics is supreme, even in developed countries, even in the so-called West uh, democratic nations, where identity politics is the center of the person. I think, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Fukuyama talks a lot about this. I disagree with him in many ways, you know, when he says in the end of history that uh, you know, one system is ruling. But I think when he talks about identity, I think that's a very strong uh, 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 concept. It's here in Kenya, it's here in Ethiopia, it's here in, you know. But I think in the Ethiopian context, we can rethink in order to get a, st a state uh, nation or nation states to, to complete. I think we need to look, because up to this point, we have imperial state that doesn't re represent one minute. I'm, I'm just concluding. This may not fit, you know, or may not make uh, everybody, uh, you know, acceptable to the idea. But I think we need to pick the big four nations and nationalities in the Horn of Africa. The Amhara is speaking about 27 million. 
that Kenya is speaking. Because the nations that we have today in Kenya was formulated at Westminster. So why can't Africa formulate? I think Ali Mazuru was the only one who touched that, but he, he touched it in a different way. He wanted four African states, east, west, south. I think we can bring that concept locally and rethink how we can refashion the state in the Horn of Africa. I think a Somali speaker, and I'm not co including the Kenyan party, but within the Ethiopian context, I think there has to be one nation that speaks that Somali speaking in the Horn of Africa. One Amharic, one Oromo, and one Tigrayna, and then the rest can fit wherever they are. I think that may really serve as two purposes. Number one, for the Somalis, it will make the dream of the thesis that Saeed Samatar and Dave Layton, a nation in search of a state. Somalis are not in search of a nation. Somalis are already a nation, but they are in search of a state. Maybe that can lessen the pressure of the Somalis you know, having issues. I think for the, for the Amaras, it will bring them down from the imperial court that they have been sitting for many years and probably accept their nation state and work with the rest of the people. The Oromos may move from the victim level that they have experienced for generations to accept the 40 million Oromos to have something that they call the Oromo nation state and then the Tigrinya speaking, which has been really dilapidated because of a feud between two gurus of Tigray and Eritrea, but still the same people. If we can find something in that formulation and then create a confederation, my thesis is that peace, sustainable peace, can be easily had, and that can lead us to manage and control famine, conflicts, and wars. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a special break.